you. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion. Please treat this as interactive. Feel free to ask questions, stop me for clarification or for questions or for discussion at any point. I've probably got too much material to get through in an hour, so um, uh, just keep on it. There won't be any time at the end. So just stop me whenever you feel like it. Uh, and also, if you find I'm talking too quickly or anything like that, as I have a habit of doing, stop me for that reason, too. Um, a little bit more about my background. I actually studied physics initially and then economics. The first job I ever had was designing the cores of nuclear reactors. I worked for the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. Um, so I'm sort of quite familiar with a lot of your business. Um, after that, I became an economist, and I actually worked for a while for OPEC. I was the economic advisor to the Secretary General of OPEC. So I saw the sort of the producer side of oil markets for a number of years, uh, and I'm familiar with that area too. Um, but I'm not really going to talk about either of those things today. My focus is on carbon and energy markets in the US. Now, the um, US doesn't really have much in the way of carbon markets. So we can deal with carbon markets in maybe 10 minutes. And most of today will be with talking about energy markets. So as you've heard, I'm sure, from Mike Gerard yesterday, the US doesn't have, at least at the federal level, carbon markets. There is no federal legislation uh, which is currently limiting carbon emissions, and at least not through a market mechanism. I mean, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is uh, about to produce some regulations on the emission of carbon uh, by large point sources, <coughs> but we don't know exactly what those regulations will be at, at this point, and they certainly won't be market-based. There will be sort of com command and control regulations of some sort. There is, however, one regional carbon market, as Mike told you yesterday. This is the Northeast states have a regional greenhouse gas initiative, affectionately known as REGI. Um, and uh, that covers about nine, eight, eight of the Northeast states in the US. Uh, it's not a particularly powerful restriction on carbon emissions. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a system which is based very much on the European Union's emission trading scheme. So that's the same, it's the same intellectual framework as that, which in turn was actually very similar to the US's sulfur dioxide trading scheme that was introduced in 1990. Um, it applies only to electric util utilities, so only to very, very large point sources. Um, just a bit lower. Oh, sure, okay, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20%. <laughs> so it applies the, uh, <laughs> this applies only to uh, electric utilities. Um, and the uh, price on carbon currently is very low. So it's about $5 a ton. Uh, the reason primarily for that is that the uh, carbon permits were allocated before the recession. Uh, and our demand for electricity has dropped sharply during the recession. And therefore, the demand for permits has dropped too. You've seen the same thing in Europe, obviously. So it's a very similar story there. Uh, the uh, permits will be reallocated in, uh, in a year and a half. And so maybe in two or three years from now, we'll see a higher price for carbon in this market. But right now, it's not a major factor in the, uh, in the decision making for, for, for utilities. However, there's a general expectation within the US that within 10 years, there will be some kind of restrictions, <coughs> serious restrictions on the emission of carbon. We don't know whether they'll be market-based or some other form. So you'll find that most utilities in the US, uh, when they make investment plans are assuming that there will be some form of price on carbon during the lifetime of the power stations that they're going to build. Uh, there's a lot of confusion, unfortunately, about exactly what that will be, and that's a major uh, shortcoming of US policy right now. And uncertainty is never good, obviously, for corporations making long-term decisions. And there's a lot of uncertainty in the US. <coughs> um, California, as I'm sure Mike Gerard also told you, has announced that it will introduce a uh, cap and trade system, a carbon market, starting next year. Um, the details are available. The general expectation is it will be a somewhat tighter cap than the Northeast states. Uh, you know, futures on that are trading at about seven or eight dollars for a ton of carbon dioxide right now. Um, that could, that could be, that, that's based on guesses, and those guesses could turn out to be wrong. Um, but the expectation it will be slightly tighter. And it's possible that the other West Coast states, Oregon and Washington State, will join California. So you will have effectively two regional uh, greenhouse gas uh, markets, one in the northeast of the US and one on the west coast of the US. Now, in addition to the, um, these carbon markets, something which is much more common in the US 
is uh, what is called a renewable portfolio standard. 30 of the 50 states now have these. And these are effectively markets for the absence of carbon. It's a sort of a negative carbon market. So in many ways, it sets up the same incentive structure as a carbon market. In a carbon market, you're charged for producing carbon. In a renewable portfolio standard, you're paid for not producing carbon. So it's much the same concept. I mean, it's an attempt to level the playing field and to make carbon-based uh, energy more expensive relative to non-carbon-based energy. Um, the politics of this is that you know, the fossil fuel industry in the US is very big and very powerful. And it's been able to block any moves to tax the use of fossil fuels. So instead, the government has had to move to subsidizing non-fossil fuels. I mean, you see some of that in Europe, obviously, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy for the feed-in tariffs. Um, but that's basically the main policy lever here in the US, subsidizing non-fossil fuels. And this happens at the state level. So these are 30 states. Um, and each of these states, unfortunately, has its own separate policy. So the regulations uh, about uh, subsidies to non-fossil fuels in New York are quite different from those across the river over there in New Jersey, quite significantly different. Um, which is, you know, it means you get people shifting their power stations from one side of a state border to another just to take advantage of, 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 of big differences in the regulatory framework. And quite a number of U.S. corporations have shifted uh, data processing headquarters, for example, from New York to New Jersey because there are very big subsidies for using solar power in New Jersey. New Jersey, ironically, has become the Germany of the U.S. It's the state with the most solar power installed even though, rather like Germany, it's not a particularly sunny state. Um, so, uh. how, does that, how does that work with your exporting to different states? Um, it's, complicated. it's complicated, yeah. I mean, the um, most... Uh, let, let me get into the details of, of these things before, and I'll try to come back to that question. So let, me try, let me explain a little bit more about how these things work. So a renewable portfolio standard basically requires that a certain percentage, so X percent, of all electric power be generated from renewable resources. And that X varies from state to state, uh, and also what is defined as renewable varies from state to state. So hydro may be renewable in some states and not in others. Nuclear may be renewable in some states and not in others. Okay? Um, these, these, these requirements that a certain percentage be generated renewably is accompanied by what's called a renewable energy certificate market known as a REC market. So here's the story behind these. If you produce one megawatt hour of power using, say, wind or solar or some other acceptable renewable base, uh, that generates a certificate called the REC, Renewable Energy Certificate, which is just a piece of paper saying, you know, one megawatt hour of power was, was produced using renewable resources. If you're a utility, then to conform with this regulation, at the end of the year, you have to present to the regulator a pile of these renewable energy certificates equal to X percent of the number of megawatt hours that you generated during the year. Um, and the uh, producers of renewable power can sell these. So if I'm running a wind farm, I produce the power and I sell the power. Then I also produce renewable energy certificates and I sell the renewable energy certificates. And I may get, and I'll show you some numbers on this, as much money for the certificates as I do for the power. In fact, in some cases, I get more money for certificates than I do for the power. So this is a major factor. So, sorry, Tim, so is, that a, is that an obligation on generators or is it an obligation on the suppliers? On the obligation on suppliers, right. on the distributors, the retail distributors. So here it would be Con Ed, for example, who has to do that. Yeah. So is yeah. it an um, interstate market or only within the state? No, the markets are state-specific, uh -huh. which comes back to your, your question. Yeah, the yeah, markets are state-specific. Um, there are some bilateral agreements between states where there, are, uh, where there is a big uh, interconnection between the grids. But in general, the markets are state-specific. And I'll show you some data on the prices, and you'll see they're very different in different markets. Um, so these renewable energy certificates basically are a, uh, a financial reward for producing non-fossil non energy, from producing non -carbon energy from non-carbon sources. Um, and uh, I think this slide simply says what I've said already. Uh, so this is just an example of um, 
some of the uh, different uh, some of the different renewable portfolio standards on a state by state basis. I took this from uh, there's a very useful document, the United States Energy Information Agency, EIA, Annual Energy Outlook. So the Energy Information Agency produces the Annual Energy Outlook every year, and it's a very sort of comprehensive summary of what's happening in the policy area, uh, energy policy area in the United States. It's available on their website. Um, so this is just uh, uh, the first of a four, four pages of summaries of what these laws are like uh, state by state. So I'll just read you the first one, Arizona. Arizona Corporate Commission decision number 69127 requires 15% of electricity sales to be renewable by 2025 with interim goals increasing annually. So Arizona have 15% of power uh, renewable by 2025. California, 33% um, by 2020. So I mean, they're quite, dif quite different. You know, each of those uh, states listed there has a different goal and a different timetable for realizing that goal. So utilities in different states, very, very different regulatory regimes. Um, but the, what is common is in all of these contexts, you basically get paid as, as a power producer, you get paid for not producing carbon. So these are just, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Even Texas, right, yes. <laughs> Actually, this is the, uh, well, there is the Texas price. So these are the prices of RECs, renewable energy certificates, in various different states uh, over the period 2002 to 2007. I mean, the point about this graph is quite simply, these are dollars per megawatt hour. So some RECs are as little as $6 a megawatt hour, some are as much as $50 a megawatt hour. Um, and they vary a lot in, over time, and they vary a lot across states. Um, so this is a very heterogeneous policy environment. And if you're a multi-state utility, and many utilities are multi-state, then you have to reckon with all of these different prices. And of course, obviously, with the fluctuations that you may see in these prices. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky area. So what happens to Connecticut? Um, Connecticut, there was discussion about removing the restriction okay. and changing the policy, so the price dropped. And then it, they decided not, so the price came back up again. And this is actually New Jersey. Um, this is, New Jersey has a specific market for solar power. So, in New, so these, uh, these are markets for any kind of renewable. Uh, in New Jersey, you actually have a market specifically for solar renewable energy certificates, which is why New Jersey has this huge concentration of solar power I was referring to just now. And the uh, New Jersey market reached, uh, and over this period of time, reached up to $210 <coughs> a megawatt hour. Remember that the retail price of electricity in the US, is, so the wholesale price, is about $50 a megawatt hour. So this is four times the wholesale price of the power. So for every megawatt hour you're producing, you're getting $50 on the market and another $200 in the rec market. No, the, uh, the utility. The utility has to conform to the, uh, the requirement here. Yeah. The Right, so the, re the utility has to produce X percent, 20 percent, 30 percent. Oh, in New Jersey, it's solar, specifically solar. Yeah, yeah, right. that's the reason for the. Yeah. Well, the power company is paying to buy these certificates. So the power company has to, the, the utility, the utility, the distributor, the distributor has to buy these certificates. The cost of the certificates is then incorporated in the cost of power. So ultimately, the consumer pays. Okay, that means that in each state, you have different price. Yes, absolutely. Every state, so I mean, here in New York, the retail price of power is about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. In Texas, it's about 8 cents a kilowatt hour. In Hawaii, it's 22 cents a kilowatt hour. And the price of power at the retail level varies greatly from state to state. Um, there's no arbitrage. Yeah. No, basically there is no arbitrage. No. So the market would be paid Yeah, the, 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 I mean the, the U.S., the grid in the U.S. is not, the national grid does not have the ability to shift power across large distances uh, at peak times. So, yeah. so in essence, the U.S. is exactly like Europe. 
It's probably the US is a less connected yes. group than Europe, yes. actually. No, but each, each individual country has different renewables. Oh, right, yes. If you think of, yes, yeah, you think of states as countries, it's very similar. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. Yeah, that's right, and there's, not, there's nothing like that in the US. There's no general agreement in the US. Yeah, and that's right. I, mean, I think that the, the Euro, Europe is more interconnected. There's more of a backbone grid than there is in the US. Yeah, yeah. The, so the, I mean, these, these, the cost of these certificates is, is incorporated in the final price to the consumer. So... Yeah. So, uh, so, so what's the question exactly? Oh, I see. Uh, what part of the invoice? Oh, um, of the retail price? Um, probably, in some cases, as much as 25% of the retail price. Yes, is, is this. I mean, not in all cases, because the prices are so different. Uh, but but in, the, in the case of New Jersey, with the solar price, yes. Yes. Okay, um, <coughs> so in addition to the, uh, so these renewable energy certificates, there are other uh, incentives to produce non-fossil, to use non-fossil fuels in the US. There's a thing called the production tax credit uh, available for the generation of renewable energy. So for every megawatt hour of renewable energy that you produce, you can get a tax credit. Uh, there are also investment tax credits. Again, for every, every, uh, every kilowatt of generating capacity that you build, uh, of renewable energy, you can get a tax credit. Um, and so there are you know, significant incentives. This is just a, uh, <coughs> this is a solar power station in Colorado. Uh, and this is a, um, an analysis of the different sources of the net present value of revenues from that program over its lifetime. So energy sales make up 8% of the lifetime revenue. Uh, Accelerated depreciation, 22%. Investment tax credit, 25%. Sale of renewable energy certificates, 42%. So basically, this guy is not producing energy. He's producing certificates. Um, which is a strange situation. I mean, it means that the economics of an operation like this, and this is a very typical for a solar power station in the US today. The economics of an operation like this is very dependent on policy. You know, if, this, if this, this, this restraint here is changed, the economics can change dramatically. Uh, you would like to think that, you know, cheaper solar panels would increase the profitability, but cheaper solar panels might increase this from 8% to 12%. Uh, you know, the, the, the make or break here would still be the regulatory framework. I don't understand. Yeah, I didn't do the calculation. I think you're probably, yes, right, right, right. I see where you're coming from. Yeah, I took that. That's, this actually comes from another quite useful website in this area, which is NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, which is actually based in Colorado. Um, and they have a lot of, yeah. Um, okay, so that's it for carbon markets for the US. Uh, so the rest of my talk, I'll talk about fossil fuels, um, coal, gas, and oil. And uh, what's interesting, and perhaps a lot of our outsiders don't really quite understand, is just how big the US is in all of these markets. So this is just some data on uh, sources of energy, primary energy in the US. The biggest primary energy source in the US is oil, followed by gas and coal. Um, the US is completely self-sufficient in coal, it's self-sufficient in gas, and it produces a lot of oil, but it's not self-sufficient. Uh, you can see, for example, from this that um, 93% of the coal goes to produce electricity, but 94% of the oil goes into transportation. So basically, oil equals transportation, coal equals electricity, and natural gas goes in all possible directions. Uh, but uh, no petroleum is used in producing, well, virtually no petroleum is used in producing electricity in the US. Coal and gas are much cheaper. Wind is cheaper. Solar is even cheaper, actually, than oil. So let's talk about coal. Uh, <coughs> Obviously, it's the most widespread uh, source of power, both in the US and worldwide. Um, it produces a huge amount of CO2 and other pollutants, so it's very sensitive. It's, its economics is very sensitive to environmental policies. We just saw that diagram. So this is uh, US coal production. 
Um, there are three basic coal producing regions. There's the interior, which means Illinois, the area around Chicago. Appalachia, which means the, sort of the, way, the east coast, southeast of the US, which is West Virginia primarily. And then the west, which means Wyoming and Montana. That's the Powder River Basin. Um, and uh, the uh, Powder River Basin, the west coast, uh, the west, western, western region of the, in the Rockies is the area where coal production in the US is growing. Uh, rapidly. Uh, production in the, sort of the older coal feeds and fields in Appalachia is dropping off. Um, prices vary. The uh, west coast coal is the least, the west, western coal, the Wyoming Powder River Basin is the cheapest. It's cheap because of transportation costs. You've got to tr put it on a train and move it 1,500 miles to get it to any decent markets. Uh, but it's also cheap because it's low quality. Uh, low thermal content, high sulfur content. Um, but um, and this is uh, dollars per million BTUs. So I'm showing the prices here in dollars per million BTUs. So you can compare this, for example, with, with natural gas, which is also priced in dollars per million BTU. And this, so you're looking here at a dollar a million BTU for Western coal. That's dirt cheap. Uh, you know, I mean, you're paying in Europe, you're paying for gas, you're paying $10 a million BTU. Here in the US, natural gas is three and a half dollars a million BTU. So this is really, really cheap. Uh, so coal is, is the most exact, in, in, in cheap in the gas. Why do you, how do you explain <coughs> the increase of the price in, in California now? Oh, um, coal prices have tended to follow uh, other fossil fuel prices. Ah. I mean, it's possible to substitute between coal and oil in some, some applications. So that's really just a run up because of that. Is, is that actually the internal market? This is an internal market, yes. Not, this is not by US doesn't import and barely exports, exporting a little bit. Um, some discussion now of putting in a railway, railroad from the Powder River Basin through the Rocky Mountains to the West Coast to ship coal to, to, to China. <clears throat> but uh, at this point, the US is basically a self-contained market. Uh, <clears throat> worldwide reserves of coal. The US has a quarter of the world's reserves of coal far bigger than anywhere else. So we think of Australia as a big coal producer. <coughs> its reserves are peanuts beside the US. The US is a huge, mm. huge coal, coal country, which is why you know, we have a lot of, the fossil fuel industry has a lot of leverage here. Um, production, biggest producer of coal is China, with the US coming number two. Uh, but China's sort of re reserve to production ratio is really quite low. Mm. And China has about 30 odd years of coal left at current rates of consumption. And China is currently moving to import, as I'm sure you all know, large quantities of coal. It's importing a lot from Australia and will be importing from the US before long. Uh, the US and Russia have massive reserve to production ratios, obviously. So there's a lot of coal left in the world. That's not a very good thing, unfortunately, uh, from an environmental perspective, but there's a lot of coal out there. Um, technology, you know, most US power stations are very old fashioned. They just pulverized coal power stations. They just crush the coal, inject a jet of uh, finely ground coal into a burner and burn it. Uh, produces a lot of pollution and has a very, very low thermal efficiency, usually under 40%. There's two power stations in the US that use IGCC uh, technologies. So they gasify the coal and then put the gas through a combined cycle power station. It gets you, you know, efficiencies up to about 60%, 65%, uh, but the capital costs are quite a lot higher. But the capital cost of a pulverized coal power station in the US is $1,800 for a kilowatt of capacity. So they're fairly cheap. Uh, they go up to more like $3,000 if you, if you go to for an IGCC power station. Um, <clears throat> so the, obviously the big issue with coal, and it's been a source of a lot of debate here in the US, is the, is the environmental impact. You know, each ton of coal produces about two and a half tons of carbon dioxide when you burn it. Uh, so burning coal is the biggest source of carbon dioxide in the US, biggest source of carbon dioxide worldwide. Um, but it's also a source of other important particulates. Uh, but um, when you burn coal, particularly in these pulverized coal power stations, a lot of fine particles go into the air and they get into the lungs and cause respiratory diseases. Um, and of course, there's lots of accidents in the coal mining area. Uh, that's just a picture of a coal mine. Uh, it's another aspect of the environmental impact of coaling, coal production. This is a coal mine in West Virginia. It's what they call mountaintop removal. You just cut the top off a hill 
and dig down into it, uh, produces a huge amount of debris and it destroys the landscape. This is also very controversial. There's a number of groups in the US trying to stop mountaintop removal, but currently most of the coal production in the US is through techniques like this. It's not, there's very little deep mining. Deep mining is, is expensive. Um, so there's some deep mining for very rich seams, but most of this is surface mining like this. Pollution blame for three. This is just some headlines I took from a, a website called Medscape. Air pollution blame for three percent of deaths in the United States, and most of that will be coal related. Um, Switzerland, France, and Austria. World Congress on Lung Diseases, where PM10s in these three countries responsible for 40,000 deaths a year. Again, most of those PM10s will be coming from either diesel or coal, and probably mostly from coal. So I mean, coal is very dangerous. This is some data on, uh, from a World Bank report that was in draft form. That was why I took this diagram from it. On deaths from, coal from air pollution in China, most of which again are related to coal, the production of coal. So I mean, coal, you probably estimate that coal pollution is responsible for several million deaths worldwide every year. Um, so coal pollution is a big issue quite apart from the greenhouse gas <coughs> and the climate change dimension. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Um, let me skip these. So the, uh, one of the things which is under a lot of discussion in the US is whether it's possible to produce what's called clean coal. And clean coal will be coal that goes through a IGCC power station, so you gasify the coal and you put it through a combined cycle power station. But you'd also have a carbon capture and storage system on the smokestack, which would take the uh, CO2 out of the, out of the smokestack and store that, liquefy the CO2 and store it somewhere. Um, Currently, there are no commercial scale implementations of this anywhere in the world. There is carbon capture and storage at Sleipner, you know, there's, there's the Statoil field uh, in, off the coast of Norway. Statoil is bringing up uh, oil uh, with a mixture of natural gas and carbon dioxide. They're stripping the carbon dioxide out, capturing it, liquefying it, and pumping it back into the fields there. They've been doing that for about 15 years now. Uh, there's the same similar technique being used in Algeria. In a, in a joint venture between BP and Sonatrack. Uh, they're taking the CO2 out of natural <coughs> gas, uh, which is heavy in CO2, liquefying it and pumping it back down. So the technologies for capturing natural gas, uh, ca capturing CO2 out of uh, an exhaust stream exist. Um, but the uh, lot of debate about exactly how much it would cost uh, to make uh, CO2, make, make uh, coal power stations carbon neutral. And the general thinking is that um, Currently, um, <coughs> coal, uh, energy for electricity from coal costs around about six to seven cents per kilowatt hour as a sort of a levelized cost. Uh, and the capital costs are roughly $2,000. Um, uh, if you were to make, um, if you were to require coal-fired power stations to capture their CO2 and store it, it would probably add two to four cents to this. So you'd be looking at so something like 10 or 11 cents eight, nine, 10, or 11 cents, as opposed to six to seven cents a uh, kilowatt hour. <coughs> um, that doesn't sound like a huge number, and you know, even 10 cents, 11 cents is less than the retail price, but that's a lot more than natural gas, and it's a lot more than wind. Uh, so that would be enough to make coal. And nuclear. And nuclear. And nu well, nuclear in the US, it's complicated. It depends on what you assume about capital costs on a new nuclear power station. Yeah, yeah. And on an existing power station, you're quite right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk quickly about natural gas. Uh, this is actually where a lot of the excitement in U.S. energy markets is. There have been sort of huge, you're obviously all well aware, there's been huge discoveries of natural gas in the U.S. <coughs> and the U.S. has moved to being more or less self-sufficient in natural gas. And indeed, there's now discussion of the U.S. becoming a gas exporter. Um, so the U.S. could end up exporting both gas and, uh, and coal. Um, this is currently probably, well, certainly the cheapest fossil fuel. So you can, I mean, the capital costs of conventional gas power stations are very low. So you can build a gas power station for $500 to $1,000 a kilowatt of capacity, uh, which means it's very attractive, for example, as a peaking plant. I mean, all of the peaking plants that cover, you know, peak demand in the U.S. are obviously natural gas based. But we're seeing more and more baseload power come from natural gas plants too. And one of the interesting things that's beginning to happen is a transition from coal to gas as a baseload power source. Uh, and that's because you know, natural gas is now less expensive than coal uh, on a sort of levelized cost basis. 
And um, you know, given the, the pollution issues associated with coal, and the fact that action will probably be taken on those, uh, and it makes natural gas look attractive relative to coal. The um, natural gas obviously produces CO2 as well, but it produces less CO2 per megawatt hour than coal does. So natural gas will be less affected by pricing carbon dioxide or by a requirement to capture carbon dioxide uh, than coal would. So that natural gas looks like a good bet to many utilities. And um, no coal power stations have been built in the US for four or five years now. All the new power stations built in the US in the last four or five years have been either natural gas or wind. Natural gas and wind between them account for about 80%, 85% of capacity additions in the last five years in the US. So basically the US is going ahead on a mixture of gas and wind. Um, and actually they, they fit quite well together because of the intermittency of wind uh, and the fact that you can turn gas powered power stations up and down very quickly. I mean, gas is a good fuel for backing up uh, a, a wind field. Um, there's no, obviously, there's no world market for gas. As you guys know, there's, um, uh, there's sort of, we've got a North American market where the price is around about $4 and a million BTU. You've got a European market, which is roughly twice that, $8, $9, $10 a million BTU. And then there's an Asian market, which is $12 to $13 <coughs> a million BTU. So the prices are one, two, three in the US, Europe, and Asia, roughly speaking. And there's no arbitrage because it's so expensive to move gas around. Um, you know, you've, you've got to either build a huge pipeline, and the pipelines coming out of Russia to Western Europe cost you know, $20 billion to build, uh, or you've got to build an LNG train to liquefy natural gas, you've got to build the, like, the LNG tankers, and then you've got to build a, a regasification plant at the receiving end. And the LNG compressors cost five to $10 billion, and the regasification plants cost two to $3 billion. So the capital costs of moving gas around are very high. Um, so at this point, we really have very different prices in very different regions. Um, that may change. You know, we may see, so, you know, given, the, given the size of the differential prices, in the differentials in prices, we may see more development of LNG uh, technology. Um, you know, it would be attractive, obviously, to take gas from the US at $3, $3 a million BTU and sell it in Asia at $10 a million BTU. So look, people are looking into that, but right now uh, you've got three separate regional markets and the US is the cheapest. Um, okay, yeah, this is just some data on gas prices in sort of Japan, European Union, the US Henry Hub, which is the sort of the basic the price place where prices are generally measured at, uh, OECD as a whole. As I said, the prices range very widely uh, across these different regions. Um, okay, gas relative to coal, sorry, relative to oil, this is the um, uh, ratio of the price of oil to the price of gas on a thermal equivalence basis. Okay, so this means that currently gas is one third of the price of oil in terms of a, you know, per unit of energy generated. Uh, so oil is just not used for generating electricity in the US at all, uh, given the abundance of gas and the abundance of coal. Um, <clears throat> U.S. gas production, this is a forecast by the Energy Information Administration. We're now right here. A um, variety of sources, coal bed, methane, offshore, onshore, and then these are the two new sources of gas. Uh, in particular, this one here, shale gas, gas coming out of shale, shale uh, gas, which is produced through hydraulic fracturing of shale deposits. And that's what's growing really, really quickly. Um, <coughs> U.S. reserves of gas, um, there's some debate about these. The Energy Information Agency puts them at about 300 uh, trillion cubic feet, uh, which is about 12, 13 years of production. The industry puts them at 2,000 trillion cubic feet. An independent estimate by the engineering department at MIT put it at 650 trillion cubic feet. Um, so there's some, uh, so some lack of clarity about the size, particularly of these shale gas reserves. Those are, these are the ones that have been discovered recently and are being produced on an increasing scale. We're not totally certain how much is inside these, and that's where the main argument is between the EIA, the industry, and the engineers at MIT. Um, however, it's clear that the US has at least 100 years 
of gas available at current consumption rates and maybe 200 years of gas available at current consumption rates. So the US has you know, hundreds of years of coal and hundreds of years of gas, basically. Um, and the US has actually some of the largest gas reserves in the world. You know, because of this, um, this, 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 this dispute about the size of the shale reserves, it's difficult to know exactly where it rates, but it could be number one, it could be number two or number three. But it's right up there amongst the, the top countries in terms of the size of its gas reserves. Now, there's been some debate recently <coughs> about whether natural gas is in fact as climate friendly as has been conventionally thought. If you read kind of standard literature from a few years back on the carbon footprint of gas versus coal, and what you'll find there, it says that the uh, carbon footprint of gas is about half that of coal. Um, there's been some argument, I won't go into, I don't have time to go into details, but some argument about whether that's true, particularly for gas coming from shale. The real point here is that uh, when you fracture, when you hydraulically fracture shale, then some of the natural gas escapes, not up the pipeline, but into the atmosphere. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Much more power, has a much higher global warming potential than CO2. So a, the escape of even small amounts of methane into, directly into the atmosphere can actually increase the overall carbon footprint, and the overall global warming potential. Of, uh, of, uh, of natural gas significantly. Um, so there's a lot of debate at the moment about exactly how much methane leaks from fractured shale rock directly into the atmosphere relative to coming up the, the pipeline where it's supposed to come and, and how much this can be reduced. Um, and the assumption seems to be that it can be reduced. Uh, in the sort of I think the general st st status of this argument right now is that um, some of the first operations to hydraulically fracture shale rock and extract gas were very um, poorly conducted, conducted to very low standards uh, in, in engineering terms. We got a lot of pollution of groundwater uh, from the water that's pumped down for the hydraulic fracturing. Uh, there's a lot of environmental damage there and a lot of natural gas leaking out. Uh, and so these statements here might well have been correct for there, but you know, the assumption is that with better regulation and also with somewhat bigger companies, most of the, um, one of my friends in the engineering field said, put it this way, he said, the, the first people in the, in the gas fracking business were cowboys. These were small independent operators uh, with very low operation, low, low safety standards, little capitalization, little concern about the long run impacts of what they're doing. They go in there, they aim to find the gas, start producing gas, and then sell out to somebody else. And their, their interest in sort of the long term performance of their wells is very limited. Um, when these wells are taken over by bigger companies, which is increasingly happening, they'll be operated to higher standards. That, that's the hope, anyway. That, that hasn't happened yet, but that's the hope. Okay, let me skip that. Um, so the bottom line is that gas in the US is cheap, it's abundant, it's a very flexible power source. Uh, you can turn gas plants on and off very quickly, uh, which makes it, as I said before, very good for backing up wind or for backing up solar power. Uh, where you know, the power can drop away very quickly. Um, <coughs> impact on climate is unclear, and the impact on groundwater, so the environmental impact, particularly of shale gas, is something which is still a source of concern. Finally, oil. Oil, as I said before, is basically just used for transportation. There's no oil power stations. Some heavy oil, obviously, is burnt directly for heating. Um, but basically oil goes into heating, uh, the, the heavy oils go into heating, um, and then all of the light oils go into transportation. Um, <coughs> and you can see that here, 1% of oil, remember, we saw this before, goes to power, 72% uh, goes into transportation, 94% of transportation is powered by oil. Um, <coughs> worldwide consumption of oil is 84 million barrels a day. A barrel is a... Uh, is 42 US gallons in liters. That must be about 100 liters, right? Yeah. Um, that's, um, so that's in terms of barrel, that's annually it's 32 billion barrels. So now of this 84 million barrels consumed worldwide daily, the US consumes 20 million. So the US consumes about a quarter of all oil produced worldwide. So it's a uh, uh, massive sink, sink for oil. Um, the big producers, well, we'll see the big producers here. So this is some data on oil production. So we look at 2009. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia was producing roughly 10,000 barrels a day, 10, sorry, 10 million barrels a day. 
Um, Russia slightly more in 2009, the United States very slightly less. And everybody else is much, much smaller. So the US is either the second or the third biggest oil producer in the world, depending on what's happening in Russia. Saudi Arabia is always number one, and then Russia and number, the US are number two as basic crude oil producers. But the US still has to import a lot because its consumption, although its production is huge, its consumption is even more huge. So the US imports about 48% of all of the oil used here. Uh, in spite of being such a big oil producer. Uh, and this is where the oil imports come from. <coughs> Ironically, the biggest single source of oil imports is Venezuela. So the US gets most of its imports from Venezuela, from Canada, and from Mexico. The US is actually not dependent on Middle Eastern oil. The US gets its oil mainly from the, from the, from the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Venezuela, Mexico, Canada. There are some imports from the Middle East, some imports from West Africa, some imports from the North Sea, but they're small. Um, and they're mainly because of their particular refineries need particular types of crude. Um, but the, the, the Western Hemisphere is largely self-sufficient in oil. Um, so uh, although the US, there's a lot of politicking in the US about dependence on Middle Eastern oil. The US is not dependent on Middle Eastern oil, except in the general sense that if there's a a major dislocation in the Middle East, obviously it affects world prices, and so the, the US pays more. Um, price of crude oil, um, <coughs> very volatile, very volatile indeed. Um, and uh, it's interesting, as back as just relatively recently, oil was trading for $20 a barrel. That's back in the 1990s, <coughs> it's gone up since then to, well, it's gone up actually above this and went a very sharp spike briefly for to about $140. So the price of oil has been rising a lot uh, during the course of the, this century. Um, <coughs> driven mainly, now there was a big price increase in oil back here. This is 73, this is 79, 80. Those price increases were really driven by supply interruptions. So this was the uh, Arab-Israeli war and an Arab oil embargo. Uh, this was the Iranian revolution and the war between Iraq and Iran, which took both Iraq and Iran's oil off the market. So those were supply interruptions, and the price came back down after those interruptions were taken away. What's interesting about this is there's no supply interruption behind this. This is entirely on the demand side. What's driving the price up here is growing demand in China, growing demand in India, growing demand in Asia in general. And if you look at world oil consumption, you'll find that oil consumption in the U.S. is actually flat, uh, really quite flat for quite some time now. In fact, there's a generally, it's generally thought that the U.S. oil consumption may have peaked. Uh, now, the U.S. is moving to more fuel-efficient vehicles slowly, but it's actually moving that direction. Uh, now, the higher price of oil is having an impact in the U.S. So U.S. oil production, oil consumption has more or less peaked. European oil consumption has more or less peaked, at least in Western Europe. Um, so the, what is driving oil demand worldwide now is entirely in Asia. If you look at the, the graph, the data on this, it's, it's flat everywhere outside of Asia, but growing rapidly in Asia. Now China's growing at 8% a year. Uh, at that stage of economic development, countries have a very high income elasticity of demand for oil. So you could see Chinese demand for oil growing at about 15% a year. Um, and so China is now a bigger oil consumer than the, a bigger energy consumer in total and a bigger oil consumer than the US. Uh, so it's, it's a big issue. So this is, this, this, this is probably not a temporary spike like these here because it's coming from the demand side rather than the supply side. If there's a big global recession, we'll see a drop again, but we'll pick up again after the recession. Um, this is just what the Energy Information Agency, again, thinks is likely to happen to or the possible scenarios for oil prices in the future. Um, the, what is interesting about this is that there is, uh, the, the, you know, this data here, of course, refers to the, the price of conventional crude oil. Um, it is possible to get oil from other sources. So, for example, in Canada, there are the so-called tar sands, uh, which is deposits of oil which occur in, in sandstone rather than in conventional sources, so that you basically have to mine this oil. I think I have a picture of it somewhere here. All right. Yes, so this is... Uh, these are tar sands in Athabasca, Canada. Uh, and this is basically rock, sand, porous rock impregnated with oil. You take the rock out, you crush it, and you heat it. 
and you, you liquefy the oil and wash the oil out with water, and you put the oil and water mixture in big ponds and you skim off the oil. So it's an expensive process, uh, quite expensive to get oil out of tar sands, about $100 a barrel. Uh, so you don't invest in this unless you think the price of oil is going to be high for a long time. But quite a few big oil companies are now investing in these tar sands. Um, what the, you know, these tar sands can produce a lot of oil at somewhere in the region of $100 a barrel. Uh, so if you really believe these tar sands are going to be big, it sort of puts a cap on the price of oil. Um, but we don't know enough about the reserves there and the, the cost of production at this point to be really sure what the long-run impact of those tar sands will be. It's also possible to produce oil from coal. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward process. For example, during the Second World War, uh, the German army ran entirely on oil generated by from coal. There was no, obviously Germany has no oil reserves, there's lots of coal. During the apartheid era, there was an oil embargo on South Africa. So all oil in South Africa came from coal. South Africa has big coal reserves. So you can convert coal to oil for about $90 a barrel. Um, so again, if the price of oil goes really high, it's possible that some of those huge reserves of coal that we saw data on earlier could be converted into oil. Um, there's a, both for tar sands and for coal to oil, there's an environmental issue. Uh, because, the, um, because you have to, you spend a lot of energy to get oil out of tar sands, a lot of energy. You have to dig then you have to bring, the, bring the, uh, the, the oil up, you have to crush it, you have to heat it, uh, to liquefy it, so you're spending a lot of energy. So the, the, the lifetime carbon footprint of oil from tar sands is much higher than the, the carbon footprint of conventional oil. And the European Union, actually, the uh, Environment Directorate, just um, last week issued a ruling, which you may have seen on this, uh, saying that tar sands oil from tar sands imported into Europe uh, would have to pay a surcharge because of its higher carbon content. Mm. Um, and uh, I think they reckon the carbon content was about 60% higher than conventional oil. And that the same, in the same ruling, they said that the carbon content of oil from coal was 100% higher uh, than conventional oil. And so that would, you know, oil from coal coming into Europe would also have to pay a surcharge for that reason. And California also has, as you, you will have heard from Mike yesterday, Mike Gerard, California has its own environmental policies. And California has a surcharge on Athabasca oil coming from the Athabasca tar sands because of its higher carbon footprint and its higher, its, its more, more damaging environmental framework. Okay. Um, <coughs> right. So this is just U.S. oil production. I skipped this earlier. Um, you can see that the uh, off the north of the uh, oil fields in Alaska, the north slope of Alaska, are, are sort of gradually running down. Um, those, you know, production there is well past its peak <coughs> and is not expected to turn up again. Um, there's an increasing amount of activity offshore in the U.S. and that's expected to continue but not to, to generate a, um, a huge amount of oil. There's actually been quite an something of an increase in oil production onshore in the U.S. Uh, that's partly because we're beginning to extract oil from shale. And there's, you know, we, I talked about gas from shale earlier on, and huge amounts of gas being <coughs> removed from shale rock. So there's also oil in shale. And the same techniques as being applied to gas can be applied to oil as well. You can hydraulically fracture uh, shale rocks to extract oil that's uh, inside of those. And so uh, we're expecting to see some increase in onshore U.S. <coughs> production. Uh, from uh, but, but partly from some new, genuinely new conventional oil fields, but largely from uh, producing oil from unconventional <coughs> sources like uh, like shale rock. Uh, so, uh, U.S. production expected to be somewhere in the re region of six million barrels a day, uh, maybe somewhat above that. Okay, um, <coughs> it's renewables. Very quickly, this is the growth of wind production in the U.S. So the, uh, as I mentioned, wind is the, uh, the most widely used renewable source in the U.S. These are, these are, it's interesting, you can see the drop from here to here, the drop from here to here. This is, these are annual, these bars are annual installations of wind capacity. This is a period when the production tax credit, which I mentioned earlier, was, was, was on, was available in this year, it wasn't available in this year, it was available in this year, it wasn't available this year, it was available this year, it wasn't available this year. 
So you can see how sensitive um, you know, the investment in wind is to the tax incentives and how badly that policy has been managed. Tax incentives available one year, not the next, available one year, not the next. It's played havoc with any long run sort of investment plans in this area. But for the last few years, uh, these tax incentives have been available on a longer term basis. And there's been a lot of, a lot of investment in wind. Uh, this makes you show that the makeup of incremental capacity, ad additions to capacity, uh, this is wind, this is other renewables, this is gas. Uh, this is IGCC, this is conventional gas. So you can see that uh, basically, um, this is roughly, what, this is uh, roughly 90% of all additions to capacity in the US are either <coughs> renewable or wind. Um, the US is basically becoming a renewables and wind economy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, renewables and gas economy, so renewables and gas, and for renewables basically read wind. Um, <coughs> so that um, very few other power stations are being built at this point, some solar. This is world cumulative installed wind capacity, and um, the US is this bar here. This is Europe, so the US has slightly, slightly less in total installed capacity than Europe, somewhat more than China. Uh, that was 2009, that's the last year I got complete data for. Um, now, wind is economically attractive. Uh, for onshore wind in the US, the cost is about five to six cents a kilowatt hour. That's competitive with gas and slightly cheaper than coal. Uh, and that's before you allow for the various incentives. That's before you allow for RECs, before you allow for investment tax credits or production tax credits. So, you know, with all of these things, wind can be wind can make a profit as low, prices as low as three cents a kilowatt hour or even less than that. Uh, so wind is competitive in the US. Um, and you're seeing, that's why you're seeing this big build out of wind that we saw a couple of sites back. So you're talking about onshore wind? Onshore wind. There's no offshore wind in the US. How about the New Jersey? What do you? New Jersey. New Jersey, there's, I um, mean, there are plans for power stations off North New Jersey. There's, there's one power station being built off Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Uh, right off the Kennedy family's home. Uh, and they, they spent many years blocking it, but they finally lost. So uh, that's going up. That should be operating next year. But that will be the first offshore. And then there's, a, there's a, um, a backbone being built, an offshore power cable being built from Boston down to uh, south of Washington, about 50 miles offshore. And the idea, the idea is that there will be a series of offshore wind power stations which will feed power into that backbone. Uh, and, uh, and then from there into the, the northern industrial areas in the northeast. Um, so they, there are plans for wind to exp offshore wind to expand quite a lot. But at this point, offshore wind is expensive relative to onshore wind. You know, I mean, the capital costs of onshore wind are about $2,000 a kilowatt capacity. For the offshore, it's more like a $5,000. And then the offshore wind, you get a you know, higher capacity factor and you get a higher wind speed and the output goes up with the cube of wind speed. The power goes up with the cube of the wind speed. So if you can double the wind speed, it's obviously very advantageous. Um, but at this point, the, the US the, the offshore wind is really a totally northern European phenomenon. There's nothing here. Excuse me. Yeah. On the issue, uh, on the question about the uh, five, six cents. Yeah. That uh, with the tax credits and no. the incentives, so that's the... That's just raw. The raw? The yeah, right. If you, that's the forecast. So if you, if you take the... Um, the capital costs, and you amortize them over a 30-year life, and you assume, uh, <coughs> I think in working that out, you assume a 33% capacity factor. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's surprising that it's, it's uh, only 50% of what we have in Europe. Is that right? Right, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I don't think that the CapEx can explain for such a difference, right? Even if the specs are different, and maybe the turbines are a bit less expensive in the US, this cannot explain such a big difference. No, I'm interested. So what, what CapEx are you, 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 would, you be, what would you be paying for a kilowatt of capacity in, in, in Europe? Onshore is a million pounds a megawatt. Yeah. How much? A million pounds a megawatt of installed Yeah. Uh, so 1.5 million dollars for a megawatt. 
So yeah, here they reckon it's about $1,000 a kilowatt. A kilowatt. Yeah. Significantly less. Yes, right, right, right. That's speculative. 15 years. Okay, well that would account, those two things would account for the difference. Yeah, okay. Ah, okay, yeah. So what when mo most of the... Uh, wind producers in the US do is they, they sign long-term contracts with utilities, which lock in a, a, a price for the life of the power station. Yeah. Yeah, the capex. I mean, the cap cost is all capex, basically. The, yeah, yeah. If the pricing then is a bit aggressive because 30 years for wind turbines... Yeah, I don't know. What's the oldest wind turbine in Europe? What's the oldest wind turbine in Europe? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the I mean the calculations that I mean, I, most of these numbers I take from this place called NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, and they're assuming sort of 20 to 30 years as a lifespan on wind turbines. And I guess it's, that's an open question whether that's a, an optimistic assumption or not. Um, and that. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Okay. So anyway, this is. Um, Certainly, even if you, for example, were to cut the life band down, once you've uh, added in these, uh, these allowances here, which uh, I showed you before are very big, wind is highly competitive. And even with you know, only a fraction of those allowances, wind is competitive. Okay. Um, let's just talk finally, just really briefly, about solar power. Um, the main story here is, again, uh, this is the same in the US as in Europe, is that the cost of solar power has come down dramatically. Uh, cost per watt of capacity has come down dramatically in the last uh, decade, basically. Um, and uh, same sort of data here. It's, you know, you basically, uh, only three or four years ago, you were paying in this country sort of roughly eight to nine dollars for a watt of capacity. You can now buy solar panels for roughly a dollar twenty, a dollar thirty for a watt of capacity. There's been a huge drop in the price. And that drop in the price of solar panels hasn't really been reflected in the cost of power coming out of solar installations yet because all of the solar installations currently operating in the U.S. bought their panels at much higher prices than today's prices. Um, so we haven't really seen any installations that have been turned on that are paying you know, this sort of price for their, uh, for their panels. Um, but the uh, expectation that it, this is just, you know, one of the attractive things about solar is that um, although it's intermittent, there is something of a match between the, the time profile of solar power production and the time po profile, you know, the, the, the load curve in a typical U.S. The, uh, typical, the, in the U.S., uh, heating is all basically oil or coal, but cooling and air conditioning, which is actually much more of a so source of energy demand than, than heating, uh, cooling is entirely electric. And uh, in the summer, the U.S. electricity market is dominated by demand for cooling, by, for electricity, for air conditioning. I mean, here in, the, in New York, for example, there's a huge peak in demand in the summer because of the demand for air conditioning. And that's a very time of day sensitive. Uh, and one of the interesting things about solar power is that at least it, it matches that daytime. It's, you know, it's, its time curve matches that daytime peak reasonably well uh, uh, during the summer. Uh, when there's a demand for air conditioning. Um, so there is, although there's intermittency, you do have uh, more predictability than you do with wind and uh, some match there. Um, so at uh, the current module prices, uh, which, as I said, so dollar twenty, dollar thirty a kilowatt, the uh, solar power is more expensive than coal, more expensive than gas, somewhere in the region of eight to nine to ten cents a kilowatt hour. Um, it could be competitive if, with coal, for example, if coal had to pay for its carbon dioxide or had to capture and store its carbon dioxide, uh, but it's not competitive at the moment. However, what is interesting is that although this is not competitive with the, the wholesale market, it's competitive in the retail market. So in the US, you've got a wholesale power market where power sells for about five, six, seven cents a kilowatt hour, and you've got retail markets where anyway, you and I buy our power, and those are anywhere from 12 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour. And this is less than the retail price. So what you're seeing is a lot of what's called off-grid 
solar in the US. So a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, operations are putting up solar power, uh, which is at their own expense, and they're using this to bypass uh, power from the grid. They're not feeding it into the grid. Uh, most of the grids in the US don't take power, but they are using it to bypass grid power, at least during the daytime. So there's a, a lot of, these, for example, Walmart stores in the US, these so-called big box stores, they have huge amounts of roof space. They have huge parking space around them. And what they're doing is they're putting solar panels on the roofs of their buildings and solar panels over their parking lots. And they can get enough power from those to power the stores during the daytime. Uh, and they can get that power for you know, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. They're paying the grid 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So they're saving money uh, by going off the grid during the daytime. And then they go back onto the grid at night uh, when the, the solar power drops away. And that, so that off-grid use of solar is actually growing quite rapidly, particularly in the south and west of the US, where you've got a lot of, su a lot of sun, and very predictable sun. Uh, you're seeing increasing numbers of big you know, shopping malls where the big stores with lots of flat roofs and a lot of ground, a lot of big, big, big footprint are using solar panels on the roof. Uh, and there's actually a company called Sun Edison, uh, which uh, basically, you know, when, the, when companies like Walmart do this, they don't install the panels themselves. They, they hire a, a company called Sun Edison uh, to install the panels for them. Sun Edison takes the panels, installs the panels. It collects the renewable energy credits, which I was talking about before and it sells the power to Walmart on a long-term power purchase agreement. Uh, so Walmart doesn't have its own capital tied up in this. Sun Edison provides the capital. And there's now three or four, Sun Edison was the first company in this field, but there's now three or four companies copying that business model and providing <coughs> off-grid solar on quite a big scale. Um, uh, excuse me, <coughs> yeah. uh, how much rate do we do the price? Pardon? So you are saying here eight, nine, ten per kilowatt, but if you had the rank, how much do you know the price? <coughs> well, it depends on the state. Um, you know, in New Jersey, the price would almost be zero. Um, that's why many, you know, I mentioned earlier that many uh, New York operate, New York companies have shifted their data processing centers, for example, in New Jersey, and they're putting in solar power there. But uh, for the ref, if you go to California, um, the effect on the, of the RECs would be um, maybe one or two cents a kilowatt hour. The REC prices are much lower. So it's not, that's not a huge deal there. You get the investment tax credits and the production tax credits too, possibly. Um, OK, so I've, I've sort of run out of time, so let me wrap up really quickly. Um, you know, coal, gas, and oil. The US has a lot of coal, a lot of gas. Um, those are the, the mainstays of power production currently, with gas basically replacing coal. Um, and they produce power somewhere in the region of 5 to 6, 7 cents a kilowatt hour for the wholesale market. Oil isn't used to, although the US has a lot of oil, it's not used in producing power because it's just too expensive. Wind is more or less competitive with these. Solar is not, but is close to being competitive with these. Uh, and so if there was any, any, for example, in a region where there's a uh, price on carbon dioxide emissions, solar could be competitive with, with gas or with coal. So that could be true in California, for example, you know, in a couple of years' time. Um, I haven't mentioned geothermal. It's a very site-specific energy source, but the west coast of the US is seismically active, and there's a growing interest in geothermal power there, um, and uh, trying to use more geothermal power. I mean, geothermal power is attractive, obviously. It's baseload, um, so it's 24-7, and the prices seem to be low. And the existing, base, the existing geothermal power plants in California are producing at 3 to 6 cents a kilowatt hour, so that's very attractive. Um, and then nuclear, there's been no nuclear reactors built, as I'm sure you're well aware, in the US since the 1970s. So the uh, issue of what the cost of new nuclear power would be is, is really rather open and rather unclear. You may have more idea about that than I do, um, coming from EDF. The, um, you know, there's uh, a wide range of estimates of the capital cost of nuclear power stations at this point, uh, depending, I guess, on exactly what, what technology is used. And also, the uh, nuclear power stations are perceived by investors as risky. So that it's, it's quite hard to raise capital to fund nuclear power stations. Risky partly because of the overruns and the co production costs and the, and, the, and the building costs and the, uh, the building timetables. And, and risky also just in an operational sense. So I think it's unlikely that there'll be any new nuclear power stations built in the US in the near future. Um, and I'm, I'm not approving of that. I think it's, it's unfortunate in many ways, but that's just a, a fact. So I haven't really featured in the nuclear in the discussion at all. 
Okay, let me stop at that point, Martha, because I'll take over. Yeah, there's, I mean, hydro is attractive too, obviously. The, um, this area here actually imports a lot of hydro from Canada. So we get a lot of power here from Hydro-Quebec and uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, and on the west coast, there's a lot of hydropower in the Columbia River and uh, in the Tennessee Valley Authority. There's not much extension of hydro. Uh, so going forward, I mean, hydro capacity is pretty much maxed out in the US. If anything, there's uh, pressure to, to reduce hydro because of the environmental impacts of, uh, of dams on you know, fish populations and, and, and riverine ecosystems and things like that. So in the, uh, there was actually a, a uh, court case in which the um, Columbia River Authority was ordered to remove some dams <coughs> because of the effect they have on salmon populations, uh, which are now an endangered species in the US. And the US has this thing called the Endangered Species Act which makes it essentially illegal to do anything which will affect the uh, survival <coughs> chances of a species which is listed as endangered and uh, gives the government considerable power to, to, uh, to make people make changes to enhance the life chances of an endangered species. And so some of the Columbia River dams <coughs> may have to be removed because of their impact on salmon populations and salmon migration. So it's uh, maybe, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, in river hydro, maybe sort of run of the river hydro you may see more of, but big, big hydro dams I don't think you're going to see any more of in the US. It's surprising you have such young guys here. I know, that's right. It's it's <laughs> yeah, yes, right. Yes, yes uh, that's right. There's nobody ever said that policy makers are rational. <laughs> The amount of what? Yeah, right. Um, no. The Environmental Protection Agency right now is undertaking a study of the impact of hydraulic fracturing on water uh, and, and the possibility for recycling the water there. Um, but at this point, we don't really have a, an authoritative study of how much water can be recycled, how much it can be cleaned. I mean, basically, you take water, you put sand into it, you put a bunch of chemicals into it, pump it down into the, into the shale at very high pressure to fracture the stuff. And then some of that water escapes, but some of it can be recycled and reused. And the balance between recycling and escaping is not clear. Um, obviously, some has es too much has escaped historically. Um, I don't think they'll ever recycle 100%, but I don't know what the upper limit on the recycling can be. And the EPA is supposed to be writing a report on this right now uh, to be released later this year or early next year. And that will be the first really authoritative statement of, of uh, you know, the, the water impact or fracking in the US. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure.